of course, the what we are very much interested in is is in your perspective, both in terms of your current uh, position at Welcome as being you know, a leader of, of thinking around health and, and the future of health and, and in the future of health in different parts of the world and how to organize things at, at the global level, but also, frankly, your Asian experience and your perspective. Um, so maybe you could say a few words about, you know, particularly maybe your Asian experience, but also if you want to put this in into some wider uh, context as well. Yeah, thanks very much. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a, a real um, pleasure to join you, and uh, I hope it'll be the first of a, of a number of engagements. And obviously, the last last year has uh, disrupted every 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 country and every society um, in very very profound ways. And I, I think it's absolutely critical that lessons are learned from this, uh, and that we don't just move on too quickly. Uh, as the political and other priorities change and become dominant again, uh, because we will face more of these sorts of events. The uh, I think one really has to look back over the last 20 years. Uh, I, I spent 18 years living in Vietnam and working very closely with a number of countries uh, in Asia. And, uh, and the truth is these uh, major regional or global events are going to become more frequent and more complex. Uh, just over the last 20 years, going back to 1999 in Malaysia and the Nipper outbreak there, we've seen a series of epidemics and pandemics making a profound impact on the region and, and globally. And uh, the epidemics, in a sense, I think, are the symptom of the underlying drivers of the 21st century, which are uh, climate change, environment change, land use change, uh, ecology change, change in the human animal interface. And of course, big, big cities with very dense populations uh, and then big cities that are linked through trade and travel with other parts of the, the countries, the region and the world. And, and those are the drivers of pandemics. Uh, and they will become more frequent and more complex as they have in the last 20 years. And, and I think that's the world we have to prepare for, uh, not the world of the 20th century. So, so when you look at um, that experience and you think about an organization like AIB coming into this space and, and how should one think about it and how, what, what would be the, um, uh, you know, the, what kind of approach would you, think would be, where can we be most useful? Well, as I understand the, the, uh, the work of the AIB, you're, 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 you're pushing forward with a, a slightly or very different model. Um, and that's a massive advantage when you start a new institutional organization. You have the ability to actually stand back and, and think, not, not negatively, but think positively of the experiences of others, what's worked in the last 50 years and, and perhaps what could be improved. You're not con necessarily constrained by the institutional uh, constraints that other organizations that have been in, around for a very long time have. I, I think that's a great opportunity. It's also a responsibility. Uh, it's a responsibility to think very deeply about the role AIB will play over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, because none of these issues that we talk about, and there are many more, uh, are going to go away. As I say, they're going to become uh, more frequent. I think what, what, what um, and what I understand of, of your work, I think uh, there's two elements that I think are really critical. One is resilience is really important. And resilience comes from having strong infrastructure uh, all of the time, not, not, uh, not there just to provide for epidemics or major disruptive events, but because infrastructure matters and infrastructure and resilience allow you to provide the best for the citizens today and tomorrow, but they also give you the resilience that when something unexpected or unusual happens, you've got the surge capacity to be able to respond to that. And I personally think it's no surprise that, that many, many countries in Asia actually have dealt better with this pandemic than many other parts of the world. I think it's because that infrastructure in some ways is stronger than in other parts of the world. Uh, and the ability to surge when something goes wrong is also stronger in parts of Asia than in other parts of the world. And of course, Asia has had a, 
series of epidemics over the last 20 years, and I've mentioned some of them, but there's bird flu as well and, and many others. And every country has actually looked at itself and reformed and changed as a result of those experiences in ways that perhaps other parts of the world isn't. So I think it is about building stronger resilience. It's about building stronger resilience that's of use all of the time and infrastructure that's of value to citizens and society all the time. And then having the surge capacity to be able to respond when something challenges that uh, status quo and be able to cope with those challenges for now and also for the long term. And one thing that has come out in the in the pandemic has been the uh, in the vulnerabilities of just basic healthcare structures in many countries. Uh, how how do you see that? Is that something that uh, you know we we will have to accept, live with, or is it, you know, how, how can we, how can no, we I, contribute? I, I don't think you do have to accept it. Um, mm. Something as dramatic and as disruptive as COVID-19 happens, and it exposes tensions, uh, but it's not just in the health sector, of course. Mm. This is, these events are a whole society impact. Um, mm. There is the direct consequences of COVID itself, the the illness that it causes. There's the indirect health consequences. There's almost no other of, other area of healthcare that can uh, function during the middle of something like COVID-19. So there's the secondary consequences on health. There's, there's then the impact on the economies, on education, on jobs, on remittances, on debt, on the finances of the country. But there's also questions of trust, uh, trust between the governed and the governing. Are, is are the infrastructures there when the citizens really needed them and in many countries that's been exposed and the inequalities in society have been exposed uh, and that has led to tension and then finally i think the fourth impact is on geopolitics um unfortunately this pandemic did come at a time of very tense geopolitics uh, in the world with one uh, north south east west blaming each other that did not help uh, the response. In fact, it, it uh, made the response worse, in, in my view. So, so these epidemics are not just about health. They cannot be prevented and responded to by just taking a health lens. They are all of society, and they, uh, and they will disrupt all of society. And I think the only way to address them is to make sure the structures and systems are in place before an epidemic hits that are of utility all the time and are strong and sustainable and then they have the surge capacity to respond when something goes wrong. And I, again, I look to Asia and I think that sort of describes many parts of Asia, not all. And there are some undoubted gaps in that in some countries and uh, in some regions of Asia. But nevertheless, the, uh, the resilience is, has been stronger in Asia than in other parts of the world. That is something to build on. That's a, a good sign of optimism for the future and, and something that AIB can build on. You, you have sort of referred to infrastructure a few times, and, and uh, uh, how, how do you see to sort of the links between sort of, you know, this is an organization that has until now mostly focused on, on physical infrastructure, increasing now also on digital infrastructure. How do you see that um, uh, relating to, uh, how can one, you know, develop maybe a, a specific approach to to healthcare that links up these two two worlds of, of health and, and uh, infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there are really, um, uh, infrastructure is critical. With, with, without infrastructure facilities, whether it's um, buildings or uh, travel and trade links or, or uh, infrastructure is very, very important, and increasing them, that infrastructure has to be digital. Um, and there's an opportunity there to, uh, to leapfrog uh, the ways of doing things. But one of the, again, um, both before an epidemic and during an epidemic, the flow of digital information has been absolutely critical to countries' ability to both prepare for and respond. So mm -hmm. investment in long-term uh, digital and data infrastructure is is absolutely critical and investment of course in infrastructure uh, again I, I reiterate that infrastructure that has value all of the time um, mm -hmm. 
and is being used all of the time because that is the only way to sustain it. Countries, governments, politicians, uh, development banks uh, only should invest in things that are bringing value all of the time and therefore can be sustained over the long term. Uh, even though I come from a background in emerging infections, my plea is to not just focus on emerging infections, but focus on the underlying infrastructure that is required. Um, but the big, most important infrastructure of, talk, of all, and it, it often gets neglected, is people. Um, infrastructure itself, uh, with the possible exception of digital, doesn't deliver things on its own. It delivers things because you have good people. Good people making decisions, uh, good uh, clarity about accountability and responsibility and chains of command and, and who's in charge and who has authority and who has responsibility. You can't have um, accountability without having authority and responsibility. Uh, and then people in the systems, people in the health system, um, whether that be nurses, paramedics, medics themselves, uh, or uh, allied to digital, but, but never underestimate the critical importance of people in investment in infrastructure. Abby, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to kind of go back to One Health really quickly and ask some questions about One Health because, um, you know, we know that almost 70%, 65% of emerging pathogens come from, you know, come from animals and, and zoonosis. Um, and as you were saying before, changing environments bring animals closer to people and there's more opportunities for viruses to jump. Um, but banks are just kind of at the beginning of working in One Health. And some of the early loans that I've seen um, with the World Bank and ADB are, are around emerging, uh, emerging diseases, are around agriculture policy, um, but I think even within WHO, this concept of One Health is still, you know, it's a very big concept. And in order to tackle it, you need to break it down into pieces. And so I think there's still more conversation that needs to happen around uh, areas of intervention for One Health. And I just wanted to know your thoughts on, um, you know, where MDVs might be able to play the best, best role in, um, you know, in working on some of these interventions. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, but, but and beyond emerging infections, um, one health concept is critical for other issues, drug resistance, for instance, um, uh, where mosquitoes go or don't go, it's critical to nutrition and uh, climate change. Uh, you know, the, a one health approach is, is critical. And, and for me, a one health approach that embraces ecology and environment as well, not just humans or animals. I think when you have a complex um, area like uh, like One Health, uh, there is a tendency, yes, to break it down. I I, I just think at some point you, you have to break it down into manageable portions, but you've got to keep a, vi a, a view of the whole entity. One of the challenges we have, I think, is that in education, for instance, we train doctors, we train nurses, we train veterinarians, we train agriculture people, uh, we train farmers, all of those exist in their own silos. Um, bringing them back together later is extraordinarily difficult. And therefore, if there is a plea for One Health, it would be to see One Health uh, as creating, a, if you like, a new generation of institutions, infrastructure, and people uh -huh. uh, can work at that One Health interface without having to learn each other's languages as senior professionals and politicians. But but bring people together earlier and try and break down like those silos uh, through education and through early career work uh, and through how systems are organized. We mm -hmm. shouldn't be intimidated by complex systems. We shouldn't think every complex system can be re re uh, brought to bear with a reductionist approach. We need to integrate them. And I think mm -hmm. that's integrating the way we train people as well as the way we then work. And uh, I think we need to see health in the much broader context in the future yeah. and, and not break it down into human, animal, agriculture, nutrition, ecology, and environment. It needs to be brought together at a much earlier stage. Yeah. Um, I have another question um, about um, something that you hear in the health space right now. We're all talking about taking this opportunity um, during the pandemic because people are sufficiently turned towards health to pay attention, but to build back better 
is um, is the phrase that's being used in the health space all the time. And I guess the question is really, you know, it's it, how, how do you build back better when countries are for the foreseeable future going to be in debt and struggling financially? Um, because there's all of this excitement and opportunity, um, especially, you know, when when the pandemic subsides and and uh, you know, and the health systems are able to kind of refocus again. But um, do you have any ideas for how we can take that, you know? I think if the last uh, 20, 2020 and 2021, and, and none of us should be under any illusions, the uh, long-term impact of this on, on finances, economies, on education, and yeah, on health and science is going to be prolonged and profound. But after you face a crisis like this, and you know, there are, humanity faces crises like this on a fairly regular basis, whether issues like this or of course conflict or or other um what is critical is is that you don't move on too quickly but you do take the time to stand back and say what worked mm -hmm. uh, uh, what worked in regions of the world or in countries and what can we learn from that what can we do that would would uh, put in place the systems and structures that would allow us to not have a repeat of that if, if we don't do that then we will um, the lessons of history tell us they'll be repeated. And, and uh, I do have a major concern at the moment that, that politically and maybe emotionally as well, everybody is sort of desperately hoping to move on and almost yeah. back to life as normal and not take the time to pause and reflect and stand back and, and think, what do we really need to learn? Because this has been a massive disruption. Let's be under no illusions. This is the, the biggest disruption at a global level for 60, 70 or 80 years. And mm -hmm. the world could go perhaps, perhaps afford to go through this once every few decades or a hundred years. We couldn't afford to go through this in another year's time or another five years time or another mm -hmm. 10 years time. But we will go through it in that sort of phase unless we put in place now the mm -hmm. structural systems that will both prevent this and give us a much greater capacity to respond to it when it does happen. So at the global level, what do you think those structures are? What do you think are the, the you know, the highest priority actions? Well, I'm not in favor of establishing new institutions. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment about new treaties and new organizations. They are fine and, uh, and there'll be some successes from those. Uh, but we've had treaties before. Um, We've had regulations before. It's not about having a piece of paper with prime ministers and presidents signing it. It's about what happens when you have those systems in place. And we cannot just think that if we sign a treaty now between uh, the countries of the world or the clubs within it, the G7 or G20 or whatever, and we don't action change, that we will have changed anything. Treaties in themselves don't change anything. They provide a framework for allowing you to change, and it's for change that's critical. I think we have to look at the existing infrastructure and uh, organizations and see how they can better be able to both prevent and respond to these sorts of very fast moving crises. I think that means, and I'm not a financial expert, but I do think it means going back and looking at the constitutions and the organizations of, yes, the IMF and the World Bank, but also how those two institutions then work with increasingly organized and structured regional development banks, because mm -hmm. in the end, this is a health issue, but it's predominantly a finance issue. Mm -hmm. um, this is an issue that requires financing in a sustained way, in an efficient way, but it cannot get around the fact it needs financing. And we cannot just see this, continue to see this as a health issue dealt with by health ministries in the world, which on the whole are relatively weak within government systems. Mm -hmm. This has to be seen as a whole of society, a whole of government, and particularly led from a financial lens to make sure that there is sustained uh, uh, investment and that that investment is used in the most efficient way possible. Yes, there needs to be reform of the UN agencies, but but don't replace them. If, if we were to replace the World Health Organization, we'd have to end up with another similar looking organization. Right. Yes, the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, the FAO and the OIE to work much closer together uh, mm -hmm. to bring about the true One Health Agenda, which embraces ecology and environment as well. Uh, but let's reform them and let's start from the fact that we need them um, rather than thinking we need new structures and new institutions. And then finally, I would say we have to address this issue of East-West 
tensions and relationships and north-south mm -hmm. east-west relations because ultimately it's a very small world and whichever of these great challenges of the 21st century we talk about from pandemics to climate change to energy use to water access to migration and conflict whatever we are if we continue to have the tensions of the last five years between east and west north and south then we are in for a very very bumpy 21st century well, thank you i think this is a very important perspective for for a, a regional development bank like like aib that we fit into a larger a larger context when you look at how this collaboration has worked for the current pandemic how, how do you how do you see it and, and do you see any uh, need for for change of the system as such is, is that you, eric do you mean by that the financial system well i'm thinking uh, actually so so probably mostly from the perspective of of uh, the uh, multilateral development banks and 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 maybe the the UN system, the WHO, UNICEF. Uh, how uh, do you see scope for for um, improved re relations or what or improved cooperation or the kind of issues we've had with the pandemic? To what extent do you think they could have been handled differently by the international system? Yeah, I, 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 that there has to be some lessons learned and, so, and some changes, and and perhaps start with the sort of health. Uh, Area which obviously I know best and know much less about the financial instruments, but perhaps make a comment on those secondarily. On the broad health side, um, I think that uh, there is there is there have been some missing missing gaps. Um, one would be in a collective uh, surveillance process. Uh, uh, whereby we can identify issues as they arrive, share that information, and critically share the benefits of sharing that information. Um, I'm always reminded by the uh, Indonesian Minister of Health during bird flu in 2005, making the point, why should we, what is the incentive to share the sequences of this virus when I'll just be asked to buy the, the vaccine in future years back from you at great at a cost I can't afford. So. But there has to, if we're going to share information on surveillance, there has to be a commitment from the world to share the benefits of sharing that information. And we do not have that in place now, as we can see by the inequitable distribution of vaccines currently as an example of that, um, with a very small number of countries vaccinating their entire population, but many parts of the world not being vaccinated yet. Um, we need to involve, in, engage in uh, science and in research and development. Uh, we cannot completely outsource that to the private sector. The private sector has been remarkable during 2020 with the uh, manufacturing, the uh, research and development and manufacturing of therapeutics and vaccines and diagnostic tests. But we can't just expect them to respond every time. Mm -hmm. The public sector and philanthropy is going to have to find a different way of working in R&D and manufacturing to make sure that the uh, public-private partnerships are able to do the research, to do the science, but also do the manufacturing for things which the public needs, but which may not have commercial drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be no commercial driver five years ago to be developing a vaccine for, for coronaviruses. The, mm -hmm. There wasn't for SARS-1, there wasn't for MERS in the Middle East, there wasn't indeed for the common cold. Uh, and therefore we were left exposed. So I think through agencies like CEPI, uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, which is there to, to fund the R&D for things that the public really needs, but which there is no commercial driver, is something we really need. And it's because of CEPI uh, and then the engagement of the private sector that we've been able to have the vaccines within 12 months of the uh, epidemic starting. So. We need to invest in science and R&D and not just outsource that to a commercial model, because there are some areas, including epidemics, where a commercial model won't necessarily fit. But we do need the private sector involved. They've been remarkable in 2020. Um, and then on the delivery mechanisms, uh, I think we're very fortunate to have Gavi and UNICEF, the WHO, who are now rolling out these vaccines, but, but also um, and Asia has been a great example of this, local ownership really matters. It's all very well to have a global approach, but 
of local knowledge, local expertise, and local ability to deliver and implement in the culture and context of societies around the world is crucial. And uh, I'm a great believer in shifting the center of gravity uh, for this thinking and then allowing those centers to come together at a global level uh, through agencies. But there does have to be local knowledge. There does have to be local ownership. And there has to be local trust in systems that will deliver it. That is the best way of delivering with all of these great challenges, I think. And then finally, on the multilateral financial organizations, currently there, I think, is a focus on working bilaterally, uh, for instance, between the World Bank and individual countries at a bilateral level. There is a gap there when things are either regional or global. And I think there has to be a stronger mechanism for the ability to pull beyond and across countries and across borders, as well as through bilateral arrangements, because these fast moving issues, climate change, epidemics, drug resistance, energy use, these aren't just national. They're certainly regional, if not global. And I think we're going to have to relook at the financial instruments and whether they have the capacity to work uh, beyond the bilateral into either regional or global pooling of mechanisms which will allow things to get done, which no individual country can do on their own. That's maybe a, a last question. So it relates very much to what you've been talking about now. So the Welcome Trust that you lead have been uh, working with the G20 to establish a new commission on sort of the, where do we go from here? Uh, how do you, um, can you say a few words about that commission and, and what, what, what you expect from it? Yeah, this is, uh, I hope, uh, will be a, a major contribution that's uh, chaired by uh, uh, Tarman uh, Chingaratnam from Singapore, senior minister in Singapore, who's done a great deal of work over many, many years, going back to the financial crisis and beyond on financial systems and structures. And uh, delighted that he agreed to chair it, and it's been mandated now by the finance ministries of uh, the Italian presidency of G20, as you say, and has had the support of the other G20 countries. The genesis of this, which was really between Welcome Trust, as you say, and the National Academies in the United States, working with the Bruegel Group in Europe and the Center for Global Development uh, as well, was to say what I've said earlier, which, which was, yes, this is a health issue, uh, but the truth is it's a whole of society issue. And critically, it's a financial issue. Uh, and, and there will be, and there are, quite rightly, a lot of very good health, global health, public health, uh, reviews of the pandemic and lessons to be learned. But ultimately, if we don't sort out the financing and the governance of these issues, then public health reports will sit on shelves like they have done for the last 20 years. And, and so my strong feeling was that we needed to respect the global health and the public health reports that will come from this pandemic, but we have to address the financing and we have to address the governance. And, uh, and we need to do that at a global level, uh, because without that, then none of the other things can work. And all of the other things just become dreams and ideas in somebody's mind, but ultimately will sit on the shelf. Uh, ultimately, the heart of it, we have to address the financial and the governance issues in order to be able to sell sort out the health uh, and all the other sectors of society that uh, depend on it. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And we very much look forward to having you then talk directly to our board members. And, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your effort. And we know that you are very committed to Asia. And uh, thank you for, for doing this.